Chaos has infiltrated and infected a hive city, spreading Nurgle's disease and decay. A new 40k adventure lurks just around the corner, but what do we actually know about the game? Hey there friends, it's Kodiak here, welcome back to Legacy Gaming. Today, I'm thrilled to say we're teaming up with Fat Shark and bringing you a special ultimate preview for their upcoming first person action game, Warhammer 40k Darktide. I truly can't put into words how excited we are for today's ultimate preview. Not only is Darktide one of our most anticipated games of 2022, but we had the special privilege of working directly with the Fat Shark developers to bring you some new information straight from their mouths. But before we get to all of that good stuff, let's dial it back and bring everyone up to speed on what Warhammer 40k Darktide actually is. Now, for those of you who have played Fat Shark's previous games, Vermintide and Vermintide 2, Darktide will look similar enough, but don't be fooled. This isn't simply a reskin of what's already come before. In fact, as we'll lay out in this video, there's a lot going on behind the scenes to make Darktide look and feel like a completely new experience. For now, let's keep things high level. You play as a convict, the dregs of society, and the Inquisition's last chance at stopping a chaos infiltration on Atoma Prime, the planet where the game takes place. You'll start by customizing a character, a new feature we'll talk about in just a bit. These characters are tied into one of four main classes, Veteran, Zealot, Ogryn, or Psyker. As you'd expect, each class is going to play a bit differently with an array of melee and ranged weapons alongside some abilities at their disposal. Once you get through those two steps, you'll work your way through the game's prologue, something we still don't know much about, but we know where you'll end up, on the Morning Star. This acts as your base of operations throughout Darktide, where you'll select and launch missions, buy, sell, and craft new gear, as well as interact with other convicts from around the world. As far as need-to-know background information goes, I think that at least sets the scene, but to really understand the Dark Tide experience, we need to dive quite a bit deeper. First off, let's address the obvious. Dark Tide is the third Warhammer game developed by Fat Shark. The safe bet would be that the game is going to build upon what came before, but as good developers often try and do, Dark Tide is set to be an evolution of the 40k formula. Let's unpack one of the biggest changes to the gameplay, the mission board. The Darktide experience isn't exactly linear and will expand over time akin to something like Destiny 2 with an evolving story that rolls out to the players over weeks and months. Instead of selecting Mission 1, then Mission 2, then Mission 3, you'll use the mission board and sign up for a mission from a curated selection. We don't know how many missions will be available at any one time, but we do know that there will generally be a few easy, medium, and hard options. As one of the most intriguing new features to the series, I was curious to learn more. When I posed the question to the developers, they said, the reason for going with a system like the mission board is twofold. The primary reason is to be able to create functioning matchmaking systems within the game, where the mutability of each mission when it comes to difficulty, side objectives, circumstances, create an amount of matchmaking buckets, where it would be impossible to find other players that have selected the same amount of parameters as you. The mission board allows us to solve this problem since it will distribute a limited number of matchmaking buckets to the players at any given time. It also serves a narrative purpose, where we can have things happening in Tertium right now that players need to attend to. So we'll also have this narrative function in the live service aspect of the game, where we can have things that the game wants the player to react to at any given moment. This plays right into the game's central idea that co-op is king and really helps offset some of the complications that could arise with matchmaking if you give players control over every variable like they did have in Vermintide 2. We actually experienced this during our time with Aliens Fireteam Elite. Players were matched strictly based on level and difficulty, and as the pool of players dwindled, this ultimately meant you were running with no one, and that's a problem Fat Shark is attempting to avoid with their third game. To bring that into focus more, consider that Dark Tide isn't going to have a simple, easy, medium, and hard option for missions. Because of things like the toughness variable, as well as enemy density variable, it actually creates 10 tiers of difficulty. You can imagine the problems that would spring up if you try and create that many matchmaking buckets, especially if the player base just isn't there to support the segmentation. This might not be a huge issue if the game has crossplay enabled, but at this time ahead of launch, the developers have said not to expect crossplay between PC and Xbox Game Pass. Oh, and by the way, for those that didn't know, Darktide is coming to Game Pass on day one. 
One of the other changes, and I alluded to this before, is the fact that you can create your own character within the 40k universe. This is a huge pivot from the predetermined characters of Vermintide 2, and it's a change I think a lot of players are going to appreciate. The goal, which is always the case, is to create a stronger connection between player and character, but it also is about creating a unique experience within a world so universally loved. Now keep in mind your character's situation, a downtrodden criminal, someone at the lowest point in their life. Don't expect perfect skin and pearly white teeth. The Fat Shark art team is really laying into the theme, creating customization options that will truly make you feel like the gutter scum that you are. Players will be able to choose between male and female variations of pretty much every class, except for the Ogren, which has to be male, and will be able to manipulate things like hairstyle, facial hair, face tattoos, body tattoos, scars, and more. One thing that's important to point out is that all of the customization options are determined from prefabbed assets. There are no sliders to manipulate aspects of your character further. This is because the team is spending a ton of time and resources developing thousands of lines of dialogue, all of which line up with unique personalities associated with each class. It makes sense, Vermintide 2 really showed fans how banter between characters could be used effectively to fill in those small gaps of nothingness between fighting, with funny moments and backstory proving to be one of the best microsystems within the game. That's something the devs have already committed to bringing over into Darktide, and they don't want to mess with that formula. Nonetheless, players will still get the chance to create their very own avatar within the 40k universe, something they'll be able to manipulate even more mid-game by interacting with the barber on the Morningstar. Creating a character is only the first step in the Darktide experience. Much like Vermintide 2, there will be a number of classes in the game for players to choose from. We don't know the finer details just yet, but the four classes we can expect are the Veteran, an Imperium Guard Stormtrooper experienced in all manners of Imperium weaponry, the Zealot, an Inquisitional Acolyte complete with a power hammer and purity seals, the Ogren, the simple-minded yet brutally strong ab-human mutant subspecies of humanity eager to push for direct assaults with its heavy-hitting ripper gun, and the Psyker, a hooded, shady character capable of channeling the dangers of the warp against the enemies of the Imperium. We've seen these four main classes in action across a number of different trailers, but I wanted the developers to go just a bit deeper and talk about some of the nuances that make each class special. They actually provided quite a bit of information, so strap in, because this stuff is really interesting. The developer said, as it was in the Vermintide series, each class is designed to shine within a specific role in a group. Veterans are best at ranged combat with accurate weapons and are great at taking out specials and elites from a distance with precision. Their class ability allows them to mark armed targets and increase their damage towards these targets for a short period of time. This makes them great at both finding that pestering grenadier that is lurking in the background and taking them out, but also allowing them to scout ahead and warn the group of heavily armored threats waiting to ambush the group around the corner. The Zealot excels at aggressive playstyles with their forward dash ability that allows them to quickly and efficiently close the gap between them and any enemy that's threatening the group, allowing the Zealot to quickly get into melee combat and go ham with their devastating melee attacks, locking enemies into melee combat with them, allowing the rest of the team to pick them off one by one. The Psyker is the space wizard of the group using warp magic to power their attacks both in ranged and in melee combat. They have access to powerful mind blast attacks that allow them to pop the heads of heavily armored enemies, even around corners, as long as they can lock onto them via line of sight. This attack is great when dealing with bulwark ogrins that hide behind their massive blast shields, acting as a force multiplier to any surrounding enemies blocking melee attacks. The Psyker can pop their heads from a safe distance, allowing the rest of the team to deal with the remaining enemies without any interruptions from the bulwark. The final class, the Ogryn, is a massive tank that devastates on the battlefield with their ripper guns and massive melee weapons. Using their bull rush ability, they can displace large groups of enemies, buying their team some much needed breathing room in tight spots. Each class has a talent tree that allows for further customization and access to a large number of weapons to further define their playstyle. As far as classes go, expect a very similar system to Fat Shark's previous game. That means each class will have a number of subclasses that they'll unlock after they reach certain levels. Because there's a much larger emphasis on ranged combat within Darktide, I expect you'll see a healthy mix of subclasses that lean one direction or the other. If the game follows down the same path as Vermintide 2, players can expect to have an active ability as well as a passive effect tied to each specific class. I don't see much reason to change this system as it works well given the chaotic nature of the game, but until we all know the details, this is just speculation and educated guessing. 
The same could be said for the talent system associated with each class, something I was curious to learn more about. I wanted to know how a shift towards more ranged combat changed the team's approach to the talent system. To which they said, one specific thing that players will be able to affect through the talent system that is specific to ranged combat in a new mechanic in Darktide compared to Vermintide is the coherency system that affects the toughness shield that all classes have access to. The toughness system is akin to Halo's shield system and allows players to take a few hits before actually taking mortal damage. But being a co-op focused game, our shields only recharge while players are in coherency with other team members, which means the players only recharge their shields when they're in close proximity to their teammates. Exactly how this coherency effect behaves is an example of something that players can customize via the talent system. If we use Vermintide 2 as the model, players will gain access to a new tier of that class-specific talent tree at levels 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30. Players will have three options for each tier, but will have to choose one option per tier at a time. Of course, there is flexibility to change these talents between missions. The devs have confirmed that this is the game plan, but tweaks are still being made, which could change the way talents work in the release build of the game. Since this section of the video is largely focused on the changes from Vermintide 2, I think we have to touch on the combat, which is noticeably different. Again, if you didn't play that game, don't worry, it's not a prerequisite by any stretch. Darktide introduces ranged combat as an equal player to the melee combat that made Vermintide's combat pretty famous. Don't get me wrong, hacking and slashing your enemies isn't going anywhere, but since Darktide introduces things like bolters and las guns, the Fat Shark team had an obligation to really make the FPS experience more polished, which they did, designing the system from the ground up and attempting to create an experience on par with modern day shooters. The developers say players can expect about a 50-50 split between ranged and melee combat, slightly more balanced than in previous games. One thing to keep in mind, ammo won't be unlimited, so players will have to make strategic decisions about when to engage in ranged combat versus melee. We've seen an arsenal of weapons showcased in the various bits of footage scattered around the internet, and as you might expect, we've moved on from the crossbows, magic staves, and flintlocks of Vermintide 2 in favor for more traditional 40k weapons of war. We've seen some well-known armaments such as chainswords and las guns, as well as the more niche ones such as the ripper gun. Moving from bows and swords to las guns and chain swords is a big pivot for the team, and as you might expect, I wanted to know more about how that change is going to impact the gameplay. The dev said, apart from putting a lot of effort and care into our players' ranged combat and creating a truly fully-fledged first-person ranged combat system within the game that can rival most first-person games on the market, I would argue the biggest change actually comes from the enemies. In Darktide, we have a lot of enemies that will attack the player using ranged attacks. This seemingly small change in the combat loop creates a significant difference when it comes to the second-to-second -second gameplay loop. In Vermintide, more or less all the enemies would swarm towards the player, with the exception of the Unger Archer and Skaven Rattling Gun, and attack them in melee range. But in Darktide, about half of the enemies are now using ranged weapons to attack the player, and they will behave as you would expect ranged enemies in a modern FPS game would, taking cover and taking pot shots at the players from afar. This is something that truly sets Darktide aside from most Horde-based games, where the majority of the opposition usually are melee-focused, and it's the players that dominate the battlefield with ranged weapons. Given that ranged combat plays a much bigger part in Darktide, the developers had to introduce some new systems to provide players with a bit of a cushion against the onslaught of bullets. Toughness is a relatively simple shield system that gives players a window of opportunity to take a few hits before being hit-stunned and eventually killed. Think of it as a bit of a grace period, giving players time to react to a dynamic combat situation. The developers also made it clear that regeneration can only occur when you're with your group, once again doubling down on that idea that co-op is king. Luckily, toughness isn't the only change to the combat. The range nature of the fighting also forced the developers to give players a few more options when it comes to moving around the world. Sprinting, vaulting, dodging, sidestepping, and sliding are all viable options within the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, which should also increase the pace and intensity of the action. So while the Darktide combat experience might look similar to Vermintide 2, it's pretty clearly not the same, and there are some differences driving the series forward into a new era of 40k violence. As it's no doubt clear at this point, the Darktide universe is much different than that of Vermintide. Adama Prime and the Hive City of Tertium is much different than that of Uberstrike, but it goes beyond just the level design. 
This time around, the developers are taking a new approach to the world players will inhabit. First and foremost, areas will be large and diverse enough to support multiple missions. That means you'll travel through familiar areas while still going down unique paths. This isn't simply rinse and repeat. Rather, the team using the world more effectively to support multiple missions, creating some semblance of cohesion within the world. As we mentioned before, these missions will all be tied to the mission board and a number of different variables. Toughness and enemy density we already discussed, but it goes beyond that to ensure that every playthrough is unique. There are three types of enemy units. Roamers and hordes make up the bulk of the enemies, easy to handle when in small numbers, but difficult to manage when they mass in numbers. Elites, which are more powerful and specialized creatures that have unique loadouts and demand your group's attention almost immediately. And finally, specials and monsters, meant to throw a wrench in the natural order of things and disrupt your team's rhythm. Players will have to contend with the Mobian Six, an elite regiment of Imperial Guards, twisted and turned mad by the Dark Tide, the evil boogeyman these soldiers once swore to fight against. The developers have said this regiment is equipped for any situation, highlighting specialists that deal in hand-to-hand -hand combat, stormtroops, snipers, flamethrowers, demolition units, and heavy weapon squads. The concept of the Mobian Six gives the team the flexibility to create within loose guidelines while also giving them the freedom to push the boundaries of what's possible, potentially creating some otherworldly type of enemies that would still fit within the mold. Because the mission board will encourage replayability, the team had to make sure each run, no matter how many times a player experienced it, felt impactful. Central objectives are now going to vary. Some mission objectives that we know of range from hacking terminals and opening blast doors to escaping down an elevator, finding and purging fungus, and killing bosses. Repeating missions will also force a number of variables, including different respawn points and intensities of enemies, as well as something the team is calling circumstances, which act as modifiers within the mission. Some examples we know of are manipulating the darkness during the mission, as well as introducing some sort of fog of war type mechanic to obstruct vision. These things will all be clearly outlined on the mission at the mission board, but as you can see, ensure that no two runs are ever quite the same. One thing we haven't touched upon yet is loot and how that's tied to character progression. Similar to Vermintide, players will receive loot upon completion of a mission. This can range from common and uncommon pieces of gear all the way up to relic items, which have many more trait options and slots. I asked the developer how the system would vary from that of Vermintide and how loot in Darktide would stand out as an evolution of the previous system. At its core, the system is very reminiscent of the Vermintide series, where players will find more and more powerful weapons to equip as they complete missions and level up in the game. The big change is that we are adding a number of systems that will allow the player to more accurately target which weapons they want to play with. Relying on a purely randomized system will result in some unlucky players that the system just isn't playing nice with. Those unlucky players out there could play the game for a very long time and just out of dumb luck never get their hands on that coveted two-handed sword that their heart desires. In Darktide, we've added a number of different shop systems that allow players to spend credits that they acquire from completing missions and buying the weapon that they want instead of completely relying on the randomized loot system. There is also a contract system that allows players to set long-term goals for powerful high-tier weapons as rewards by completing a number of tasks or quests to unlock those powerful items. The crafting system will also allow players to fine tune their weapons and swap traits around to complete, in their mind, the perfect arsenal. There's also a large number of cosmetics that players will unlock as they complete achievements and level up their character, allowing them to fully customize the look of their character to best reflect their fantasy. In Vermintide, there were a number of factors that could also increase how much loot you received after a mission was complete. There's no word yet if a similar system will be used in Darktide, but I have a hunch the loot will come fast and furious. For the first time in the Fat Shark 40k games, there will also be randomized stats associated with specific weapons. This means god rolls officially become a thing, and since the endgame experience is going to be all about gathering the best loot possible, that makes the process a bit more RNG dependent. This all ties into a new contract system, which allows players to lock in a specific item that they want to track down. By completing enough contracts, they'll be able to target and purchase that item that they want, taking some of the usual frustration with a purely RNG system and injecting just a bit of control into the pipeline. Players will also receive an item every time they level up. Currently, a class can ascend to level 30, but that's not set in stone yet, and in fact, something that the team could very well change before launch. On top of completing a mission and leveling up, loot can also be obtained through the vendor on the Morningstar as a sort of stopgap in case your loot luck is abysmal. 
What a player can equip isn't confirmed yet, but it's pretty obvious that players will have both a melee and ranged weapon, and will most likely have some sort of amulet and trinket. I can see them retooling either of those to fit the theme of Dark Tide, but when you strip it back to its functional foundation, that's my educated guess. A crafting feature will also make its way into Dark Tide. Now, this system hasn't been revealed quite yet, but there are a few things we know to be true. First and foremost, you can change up and even move traits from one weapon to another. I hate to keep looking back at Vermintide, but when so many things remain an unknown, it's our best chance at understanding what could be coming to Dark Tide. Now, in that game's system, players could salvage gear into components, craft items, reroll the properties of an item, reroll the traits on an item, upgrade an item's rarity, apply an illusion, and convert dust to a lower tier. As I've already said, collecting loot is a key part of the endgame experience, but so is hunting down and unlocking cosmetics. The team is taking this a step further than it did in Vermintide 2, providing more options for players. Cosmetics for the head, upper body, lower body, and accessory slot can all be found or unlocked during the game. There's also an in-game cash shop that the developers will fill with cosmetic loot, none of which will have any impact on gameplay. There will also be clear distinctions between cosmetics earned and cosmetics bought, clear visual differences that let folks know what's what. This is relevant because the Morningstar is going to act a bit different than the Keep. Not only is it a hub for all things relevant to your character and prepping them for a mission, it's also an important social hub that could support up to 20 players at one time, or at least that's the goal. This is a much different approach than the small party instance-based approach in Vermintide, and frankly, I'm all for it. Cosmetics are best appreciated in more of an MMO type setting, and if the team can create a communal space that brings more players together without diluting the game experience, I'm all for that. We mentioned before that the Morningstar will feature the Barber, but it also features a number of other important things, such as the Mission Board, a crafting vendor or station, a contract vendor, a credit store, and mailbox. Most of these things we touched upon before or are self-explanatory, but one thing I did want to point out was the mailbox. This will not serve as a means to send other players mail or items. It's simply there to allow players to collect any loot after a disconnect or if the developers decide to push things out for some sort of community event. As I said in the intro, Dark Tide is one of the few games left this year I'm truly looking forward to playing. Vermintide and Vermintide 2 set the stage, but it's the darker, grittier, and more ambitious Dark Tide that will truly define the legacy of a series that has helped put Fat Shark on the map and keep 40k relevant in the video game space. With other titles like Space Marine 2 in the works and a handful of other Warhammer games recently announced, Dark Tide could be the catalyst that brings the universe back to the forefront of the gaming landscape. Once again, I want to thank Gunner and the Fat Shark team for giving us a peek behind the curtain and letting us share some new Dark Tide information with you all. Getting the chance to work directly with developers has been such a blast, and we hope to continue it into the future. Ultimate Preview is truly one of our favorite series to put together, so if you appreciate all the work that goes into bringing these videos to life, we'd appreciate your support. Hit that thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. With big games like Gotham Knights, Hogwarts Legacy, and Hollow Knight Silksong right around the corner, you never know what Ultimate Preview will put out next. If you're planning on playing Dark Tide, I also want to invite you to our Discord. Our community of over 20,000 members is spread across dozens of great games, but with a section dedicated just for Dark Tide, you better believe there will be other convicts just like you looking to team up. Finally, if you like everything we're doing here on the channel and you want to support us even more, consider becoming a member. For just a few bucks, you're helping Livid and I achieve our dreams of becoming full-time content creators. Check out the join button below to learn more. My name is Kodiak, and from everyone here at Legacy Gaming, thanks for watching, and play on.